Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to another edition of the Center for Security Studies online lecture series. We are very honored to have Air Marshal P.K. Roy with us today to talk about the strategic importance of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in India's security planning. Having retired from the Indian Air Force, Air Marshal P.K. Roy is the recipient of the Param Vishisht Seva Medal, the Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, the Vayu Sena Medal, and the Vishisht Seva Medal. Sir is a helicopter pilot with over 4,500 hours of flying experience. During his 40 years of distinguished service, the important appointments held by him include the command of units and stations, senior officer in charge, administration, and assistant chief of the air staff, personnel airmen, and civilian. On promotion to the rank of Air Marshal, Sir was appointed as the com Commandant of the prestigious National Defense College and led delegations of senior officers to Israel, Chile, Mexico, South Africa, Morocco, Sweden, and China. He also represented India at the Asian Regional Forum meet at Bali, Indonesia. The Air Marshal was appointed the post of Commander-in-Chief of Andaman Nicobar Command and has also served as the military and air attache in the Indian Embassy at Ukraine with accreditation to Romania. He is a graduate of Defense Services uh, Staff College, Higher Air Command course, and alumni of National Defense College, New Delhi. For his distinguished services of an exceptionally high order, he was awarded Vayusena Medal, Vishish Seva Medal, Ati Vishish Seva Medal, and Param Vishish Seva Medal in the Republic Day Honors List of 1995, 2005, 2007, and 2014, respectively. The Air Marshal superannuated on 31st May 2014. Post retirement, he has authored the book Strategic Vision 2030 for Security and Development of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, along with Commodore Aspi Kawasji. Today's topic is an interesting one. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands are strategically located at the western mouth of the Malacca Strait, which connects the Indian Ocean region in the east to East and Southeast Asia. No nation could be more fortunate than India for gaining the natural ability to preside over such a crucial choke point. For many years, the island group was alienated from the mainland due to a lack of understanding and strategic thought culture among the leadership. Recently, however, we have seen the island group gain new life to its importance. Having formerly served as Sinkan, there can be no person with better knowledge on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands than Air Marshal B.K. Roy. I now hand over the floor to Professor Dr. Pankaj Jha, the Center Director of CSS, for his remarks. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and welcome, Air Marshal B.K. Roy. Uh, in fact, uh, your book, which talks about Strategic Vision 2030, is very interesting given the fact that it highlights what Andaman and Nicobar can be envisioned for. Particularly, I'm looking into three major points which might be a, a, you know, a curiosity from a layman's perspective. Can Andaman Nicobar be the Hawaii of India first? Second, given the fact that the, the environmental concerns are there in Andaman Nicobar, even though we are laying the stable network with the assistance of Japan and other things, can it be a rendezvous point for quad uh, countries as such? Because earlier it has been talked about. And third issue is that there is a lot of potential in Andaman Nicobar Islands with regard to developing tourism as such. So can we look into, because Prime Minister Modi also talked about, you know, developing these uh, facilities in Andaman and Nicobar Islands when he visited. And we look into what exactly are the feasibilities, you know, there might be announcement, but what exactly are the feasibilities of developing this Andaman Island as a, one of the uh, offshore carriers that India has, and which still needs a little bit of nurturing and maintenance as well as developing into full full, full force joint command as such. So thank you, uh, Air Marshal Roy. We look forward for your talk as such. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Jha, for uh, inviting me to speak to the students. Uh, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that I always look forward to, to interact with the students. Uh, maybe uh, because uh, I never had an opportunity to attend a college. <laughs> uh, yesterday was the passing out parade of National Defense Academy. I uh, 
joined NDA and continued in the service, never experienced a college life. So it's always better. I always feel nice interacting with the students. And uh, I must thank you also for selecting an extremely interesting and topical subject. And why do you say that topical? You, in your introduction, you uh, said that. Basically, if you look at the security environment today, we are going through tremendous upheaval. You have the COVID pandemic, you have cyber warfare going on across, you have uh, US-China uh, conflict, in, not exactly conflict, but tremendous pressures. You have India-Pakistan, Afghanistan issues coming up. You have India-China never been at loggerhead so much as we are today. And in all this, the Indian Ocean region uh, comes in, and you'll realize as you speak. Uh, that is why I feel it's a very, very topical subject, and I'm sure the students or whoever uh, the audience would uh, benefit uh, from this talk. What basically I intend to do is to first give you an overview of the strategic and security environment in the Indo Pacific. It is important to understand, then only you will be able to understand the importance of Andaman Nicobar. And then why India is a stakeholder in the Indian Ocean region. Next, we will go on to the Andaman Nicobar Islands, understand the island and a little bit about the Andaman Nicobar Command, and then move on to the strength and weaknesses of the Andaman Nicobar Islands. We can extract these strength and weaknesses from understanding of the Andaman Nicobar Islands. And thereafter, from the strength, weaknesses, threats, as well as the opportunities, uh, we can will draw out certain uh, policy recommendations. I have intentionally not included terrorism and other groupings. Uh, basically, basically, that would be a, an excellent study by itself, various groupings that are coming up now or have been there. And I'm sure uh, you will be planning such uh, talks. To understand the international security environment, we need to first go back into the history and check the shifting patterns that have taken place. If you go back into the history, you realize in the 18th century, India and China dominated the world. Half the global GDP was in this area. Unfortunately, we lost it. And uh, in the 70s, I'll jump across. We, we had Cold War where US and US are USSR dominated the world. At that time, China was poor and isolated. It was not what it is today. Europe was divided. There was no EU. Japan itself was not an economic power. It was coming up after the Second World War. India was trying to transit through a socialism. And then suddenly in the 90s, we have disintegration of the USSR. And US, we suddenly we had US being the Sole superpower. And when you look at this century now, we are coming around in a circle and the global power is slowly trying to shift to Asia Pacific region back to its original place. US domination is being challenged by the uh, China and various other countries. And we are heading again uh, towards multipolar world. China somehow has caught up and is emerging as the regional and global hegemony. Uh, as a typical rising power, it, it actions indicates its intention, intentions. It is using its economic power, economic leverage to further its foreign policy. You have flashpoints in Taiwan, you have flashpoints in Hong Kong, South China Sea, you look all over. Okay. There are deteriorating relationships between US, China, Russia, which will create upheavals. There is a, unfortunately, a major part of the world is, which is the EU has got a leadership vacuum today. Cyber terrorism, I spoke, it's affecting the world, security and economy. There are internal tensions. Look across the world, you'll find there are serious internal attention and flashpoints all over. Clashes between India and Pakistan at a lower level, but it is continuing. China, it is escalated, as I said in the beginning. Couldn't have imagined that they will do what they tried to do in Ladakh. And today, it is going on in uh, Arunachal. Again, it's escalating. And last but not the least is the COVID-19. The pandemic has affected the entire world. 
not only health wise but economically politically and uh, social stability has been affected and within the asia pacific region there is tremendous need for china to keep the indian ocean region open for its maritime trade it has to keep its the straits of malacca lombok and sunda open for a, for the flow in of the energy and raw materials as well as flow out of the finished goods that is important to understand it is not only a one way traffic that is why you have various string of pearls ports and pipelines in myanmar and various other places the cp is in pakistan its movement toward its uh, forces in djibouti and basically it wants to secure the malacca basically it wants to keep its trade going through the indian ocean region i am sure you know the anti piracy fleets that are deployed in the gulf china is the only country rest all are doing it as a combined effort for anti piracy work but china is the only country which is doing it independently that gives us or assures us a presence in the indian ocean region the ships keeps moving up and down its submarine force also indicates it uh, indicates uh, intentions in northeast asia we have ri again rivalry between all the countries there russia china itself uh, japan and the two koreas southeast asia again china has tied them into a web of economic activity they have no choice but to continue with that they even if they don't want because of this economic web but then they look at india as an alternative heavyweight at which we have to rise to that occasion and towards india we all know it is has a policy of containment it's arming our neighbors it is influencing them and we have trying to catch up somehow we have always been in a catch up mode of course africa it has moved into further resources and that is why its presence in iur is important for it and of course important to keep for us to keep it clear now india what, what is the stake of india in this just uh, look at this map it is important to appreciate geography it is important to appreciate economics and strategic importance of the indian indo pacific region and i'm sure you must have been told about the indo pacific by now so i will be using indo pacific and iur to just to clarify which zone we are in if you look at the indian ocean region you have the swiss canal in the swiss in the west and you have the malacca strait and other straits on the eastern side that means in the ocean region the entry and exit from both side is constrained by choke points it's extremely important to appreciate this and within the tri junction of the western southern and southeast asia lies india jutting out into the ocean it enjoys a strategic centrality in the world's most important waters passages of today so that is the importance in your own time just invert the map and see you will find how important india's jutting into the indian ocean is for our strategic requirements and this is the ocean which has got 40% of world's energy reserves 65% of raw materials rubber tea spice and jute are produced here unfortunately along with this we also have extreme economic driver cities which needs to be uh, which will create upheaval and uh, if you look at the iur again it's a lifeline of trade and economy entire trade flows through this world trade half the world container transshipment ships go through this uh, the slocks of indian ocean region one third of bulk cargo traffic goes through that two third of oil shipment passes through uh, these choke points and these remember these figures are going to increase by the day they are not going to reduce they will be clogging the sea lines of communication and as it is if you look at it from the air it's like a highway and you have 
uh, within the Malacca Strait, they are one behind another, like uh, your traffic on the roads. That is the type of traffic we have. Okay, and most importantly, you must remember that this trade is not only for the Indian uh, Asia region. The trade through the Malacca Strait goes beyond this region. So everybody is uh, affected because of this, and that is why uh, the Indian Ocean region is uh, significant in every uh, which way that you. Uh, look at the security environment within the IOR. Now we saw the entire world why India has just taken it. The security around the IOR itself, you look at it. Every country here has got some issues, or which has a spillover effect on the maritime domain. The volatility in the Gulf, extra countries, constitutional authority of army in Pakistan, radical punk. Pressures in Bangladesh, which you recently saw what happened. Alienation of Tamil and Sri Lanka. There are issues coming up on setting of the committee for one nation, one uh, law, because there is no Tamilian in the, in the committee. Unsettled situation in various countries like Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia. All these have spillover effect in the maritime domain. And you understood how important it is. And more importantly, this area is prone to disasters. 2004 tsunami you heard, and thereafter various monsoons or cyclones that have hit. The tremendous amount of effect takes place. That is socioeconomic stresses, and they are used to, they are open to exploitation by the state as well as non-state actors during these calamities. If you look at the linkages, Sada Parikar in his time had uh, said a lot about India, and I will not uh, go over his sayings, you must have read it. Uh, Indian Ocean has always been important for our economy. It has always been important for our freedom and remains so. We have a major, major stake in the Indian Ocean region and keeping it. India is pivotal to the strategic balance in the Indo-Pacific region. That you must understand. Now, under, having understood this, let's look where do the Andaman Nicobar Islands feature in the geopolitical scenario. Just look at this map carefully. These islands are located almost 12 to 1400 kilometers east of the east coast of India, extending the border, extending the coastline by that many kilometers. They are linearly placed north-south, sit astride the lines of communication. You can make out from the map. And more importantly, they are so close to the Southeast Asian countries. 165 kilometers Indonesia, 450 from Thailand, 600 from Myanmar, whereas 12 to 1400 from India. 1% it, the land mass there is just 1% of the Indian land mass. Unfortunately for us, this provides us 30% of our EEZ. EEZ, which is rich in oil and mineral reserves, which has not yet been exploited. There are 836, and earlier you must have read the different figure, which has been going on for ages. Recently, a study was carried out, a survey was carried out, and we have identified 836 islands, rocks, or just, just jutting out so they all, and 38 of them are inhabited. It has a coastline of 1920 uh, kilometers, but it gives us six lakh square kilometers, as I said. The entire length of the island from top to bottom is 720 kilometers. And look at the location. Just to explain the island so that you, in the end, you know well, and appreciate, the islands are divided into two groups, the northern group of islands and the southern group of islands, which are separated by 10 degree channels, which is almost 80 nautical miles, that is 150 kilometers. I hope you can make out from the map. And these two groups are de facto independent battle zones, separated in time and space. It takes time over the sea to travel. Bridging this gap remains a formidable 
uh, challenge. Just look at the map. I have tried to highlight it on the port on the left side also. The six degree channel is at the bottom below the southern group of the islands and 10 degrees in the one which is dividing the northern and the southern group. Now let us look at the, just to tell you Port Blair is the capital and is connected to the northernmost town of Diglipur by one class nine road. That means nine ton truck can go over it. 200 kilometers takes almost 12 hours to travel. It travels through the main Jarawa tribal belt where tribal forest where it has to be escorted all the way. The road is not continuous. There are very sight in between. So it does take time to travel in Andaman and Nicobar Island. Coming to the southern group of island, there are three groups actually within the southern group. One is the Karnik group. Nicobar Island. Karnik has an Indian Air Force uh, runway, uh, the map on the right, we are, sorry, the picture on the right, uh, full-fledged runway, a 10,000 feet runway for the Air Force aircraft. This needs to be exploited, which we will see later on. It has a small jetty, that is a major, major problem, very small jetty. So if you want to develop this airfield, the bigger ships cannot come here. It will be developed in its own time. Let's see. The non kovari group, the second group, is uh, located in the center. That means Kar Nicobar on the north and uh, uh, Great Nicobar on the south. You have uh, INS Kardip, a Coast Guard station uh, there. there. There are a group of 10 islands here. And last but not the last is, is, is the least is the uh, Great Nicobar Island, the bottom one. Uh, it is the largest island in the southern group of islands. And uh, Campbell Bay, you can see on the map on the right, written in the red, is the southernmost airfield, uh, 300 miles south of Port Blair, which is uh, just about 3,000 plus uh, feet being developed. Uh, aircraft class of AN-32 AN can land there, is being developed slowly. <clears throat> Indra Point is crucial to overlooking of the six degree channel through which the entire passage of the uh, sea lines of communication ships pass through this. What you must remember is because of its isolation, the vastness, this area is most threatened. We need to develop these islands. There's tremendous amount of land. Air Force had 2000 square uh, kilometers of land, but unfortunately, uh, tsunami affected it badly. In fact, uh, the Indra Point, which is supposed to be the southernmost point in the country, has moved up northwards by about 150 to 200 meters because the land has gone into the sea and during uh, tsunami. Logistics here is sustainable by uh, ships and air only. There is no other way. You can make out from the map the gaps between the islands. That is the biggest problem. Forest, we all know it's a forested island a chain, 7,000 square kilometers. That means 86% of the total 8,249 square kilometer is forest. You just have 1,200 kilometers, 1,250 uh, for your development elective activities. And even these 1,250 kilometers is distributed over 800 chains of uh, 800 islands. So there is no, it's not contiguous, so that you develop them. Certain islands will have 10 square kilometers, certain will have 50, others will have 20. The entire chain uh, land available is just about uh, 1250 square kilometer. And out of these 7,000 square kilometers, 34% of forest area is inhabited by tribal and notified as tribal reserve. These are the constraints that you will see as we as we move. Imagine 1,000 square kilo, uh, kilometer of forest reserved for Jarawa tribe, which are 400 in number. Must have reduced by now. Economy depends on fishing, agriculture, tourism, handicraft industry, because the development is a difficult process here. It's not uh, impossible. It is difficult. 
main hindrance in the development of major industries is restricted availability of land raw material everything has to be brought from the mainland and unfortunately there is no market for the manufactured goods locally the goods have to come back to the mainland to be sold so these are the issues with uh, tourism as brought out by professor uh, dr cha is a big big industry that needs to be developed it is big by itself now itself now but then it's that lower level of industry uh, 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 tourism industry it needs to be enhanced to much much higher level you, you know uh, they say in tourism if a tourism industry if a person comes and doesn't spend around 200 dollars a day is not a viable proposition the amount of money that goes into developing so you need to have both lower level tourism as well as higher level tourism unfortunately andamans is still ltc tourism infrastructure development has got unique peculiarities i spoke about the uh, forest land availability of land now proximity to coastline restricts construction protection of aboriginal tribal sect and maze of rules and regulations delays the projects here that must be very very clear projects are delayed here because of these issues short working season almost 5 to 6 months of severe monsoon so your working season is just about 5 to 6 months like it is in uh, leh ladakh uh, kashmir area where because of temperatures working season is just for 6 months so short working season has effect on your or uh, delays the works so what emerges is lack of raw material remoteness of the island and bevy of rules and regulations not only delays but escalates the cost of the project it's extremely happy i'm to inform you that earlier we used to get even sand and boulders and pebbles from the mainland for construction now the government has cleared getting it from the neighboring countries so earlier we used to be looking everything from the prism of security false sense of security i would say that what can they put in sand and boulders if i construct my runway with the malaysian sand or indonesian sand but then things are changing now i am not being negative please i am just trying to tell you the uh, the the difficulties of the area and then we will see how we are developed these are the difficulties only so we can clearly say infrastructure projects in andaman nicobar islands come with long gestation period and it requires tremendous amount of foresight and planning and implementation so if you understand these problems of the area you will be able to plan in advance if i want to position fighters in the southern sgi fighters may come after 10 years but remember the infrastructure planning must start today it should have started yesterday look at the terrain in which they work there ports a may port blair is the only uh, major port with adequate otr facilities grossly inadequate everything comes to port blair center of the chain and then is distributed so we need to construct or establish more and more ports along and adequate size ports not the jetties for smaller boats coming to andaman nicobar command itself a few words not much uh i am sure you all know post kargil a kargil review committee was established which recommended establishment of a joint command a uh, unified command in andaman nicobar island and approved which was finally approved by the group of ministers and a unified operational command the first unified operational command was established on 8th october 2001 uh, the date matches with the air force day also 8th october if you remember the aim is to foster basic aim was to foster joint membership among uh, three services that was the starting point sincan reports today directly to the cds earlier he used to report to the chairman chief of staff committee and now that cds has been established he reports directly and lot of changes have come with this a lot of changes have and the role of andaman nicobar command is all encompassing defense of ani 
that includes its waters, its airspace, and HADR. Andaman Nicobar has command has a well-defined organization structure. You have the CNC, and under him, you have three components of the three, four components, actually, Coast Guard also, and they provide him with the support and the infrastructure and the force availability. Our naval component has got the Donia, Chetak, and variety of ships. The numbers will not go into now, but suffices to say they have a variety of ships. A, a 10,000 feet runway is available, which is under the Navy at Port Blair, being used by civil air. INS Bogs, we spoke on about the Campbell Bay. The, sorry, the Campbell Bay runway is a naval station which is called INS Boss, Indian Naval Ship Boss. Air Force is located at Karnik, 1,000 feet. You saw the 10,000 feet runway. It has got Mi-17, V-5 helicopters. It has got radar and a Donier detachment there. Army component has a, a mountain brigade. I hope I'm not going too fast. The Coast Guard also has a fleet of various types of ships and air assets of Donier and uh, Chetak. These aircraft normally do the uh, surveillance of the uh, area. Plans exist to enhance the resources as well as the infrastructure. When will come up, only time will tell. Basically, the, uh, the leadership has to balance out between the need in the mainland and the sea. And the islands there. I used, I, I said that uh, as an experiment for joint manship under Manikwa. So I must talk about joint manship here. I will not get into what discussions is taking place in the media, but I can tell you that Andaman Nicobar Island is an ideal place for experimenting with jointness and then building upon it. And that is what is happening. First of all, remote location, widely spread out, displaced chain of islands. These two factors demand jointness. You can't help but work as a joint team, all the four, that means Army, Air Force, Navy, as well as the Coast Guard. You have to perforce work as a team. And that is what is happening. And you saw it in the way they... Uh, provided support in the tsunami because they were themselves affected by the tsunami. The entire chain was affected, but the amount of support they gave, the, the way rehabilitation was carried out, not only for themselves, their forces, but for the civilian is uh, praiseworthy. Reduction in poaching, illegal my immigration is tremendous. All the three services carry out such things. Illegal immigration, we have a system of Jan Pai Chan where in rotation you visit each island. Some go by ships, some go by air, some an army is required everywhere. So you visit each island as per, uh, at a regular frequency and see what is there. Even uh, islands which are totally in, uh, uninhabited, you will find some sort of uh, indication of has somebody come there and gone. That is being done. Let's look at the strength now. Have we understood the international security environment, the IOR, and understood the uh, ANI as well as the uh, ANC under Manikoba Command? Let's look at the uh, strength. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, it has the potential. We have seen its location, provides it with potential for furthering the Indian political, military, and economic interest, especially, I say this again, especially in the presence of an assertive China. And more importantly, development of these islands not only provides support to itself, the island itself, but to the coastal defense of mainland, because you have something 1,200 kilometers away. No country has got it in the world. You have something 1,200 kilometers trying to extend your arm of defense. Um, strategic, of course, location makes it an excellent geopolitical. The world is looking for islands to, for their own uh, 
benefit and we have god given island available to us we must look at and of course ez has got significant uh, uh, potential needs to be exploited somehow we have neglected it now we are looking at it now as dr uh, professor dr jha said it has tremendous potential for development of tourism it's an important strength of ani one of the most important strength after its uh, strategic uh, location and proximity to the busiest trade routes assist us in leveling our act east uh, policy we are trying to do move act east policy from the mainland here the andaman uh, will provide us with that and we have it provides us with multiple military options to keep a surveillance on the indian ocean ior region the slocks the choke points and of course for a power projection it of course facilitates domination of the 6 degree 10 degree channels and in the bay of bengal zone weakness what has emerged from this entire talk is isolation distance from the mainland dispersed islands small small islands and environmental constraints are major weakness of these islands and development activity has to be sensitive to ecological ecological fragility this is a major major weaknesses key challenge of course is non availability of land and that is forcing us to congest everything at port blair we are not moving towards the sgi we are not moving towards the north so we need to decongest port blair and make this land available poor air and sea connectivity impacts economic and strategic development activities simple submarine cable what uh, we spoke in the beginning has been laid port blair and surrounding areas have been connected but the process of extending it northwards and southwards is a huge process but it is a part of the present contract and it is moving it has been pending for ages tenders are made and then it dies a natural death but this time it has a progressed i am not saying this because I, i am a pro government or something but we have seen this happening in in last 7 8 years now uh, coming to threats itself the first and the most important threat is the terrestrial mindset of the mainland policy makers this needs to be got over which has relegated these islands as an outpost we need to convert this mindset to looking at it as a launching pad launching pad economically launching pad militarily and strategically we like i said slowly things are changing but we still have miles to go unrealistic environmental norms go against the strategic economic development a major major threat to developing this i know many of the uh, students who are also doing environmental studies may not like it but then we have to balance between the strategic and the economic or the uh, strategic and the environmental requirement look at the world what they are doing you can't be a mahatma gandhi for every aspect somewhere you have to take hard decisions it depends you have to balance it out how much to do where to do you have to balance it out concentration of most of the infrastructure like i said earlier because of land availability is in port blair not only the port itself everything is at port blair something wrong if you look at andaman nicobar islands by themselves their greater challenge is internal security they don't presently they don't have any external security as of now threats are there majorly these are illegal immigrations we found in my time boats from uh, sri lanka on uninhabited islands 
That means people had come there. Poaching, because we are not fishing in the zone. Others are coming. Okay, there's a saying that uh, the fishes die of old age in under months, not because of Arms smuggling through inevitable, that is how we have these Jan Pechan petrols that I spoke of, and of course, natural disaster. Economic front threats are same what we discussed just now, non availability of raw materials, local market for finished goods, environmental constraints also, and threat are these are the threat to the development. Now, let us look at opportunities. And if you want to sum it up, I would say India's aspirations of becoming a regional power, its economic and political military interest in IOR can be realized through the presence of ANI, that means Andaman Nicobar Island in its square. Well, it's a tremendous, it has tremendous potential. We need to seize this opportunity now when we are looking positively towards these uh, islands and develop it into a hub of activity, a springboard for power uh, projection. India can contribute in shaping the Indian Ocean region's economic and so security architecture through these islands. Tremendous scope of growth is available there. We need to look at international tourism, look at Maldives, look at Sri Lanka. Why can't we achieve those stages? If the government of India has uh, identified 12 islands for development. Three island development has already started. There are political pulls and pressures in whatever we do in our country, but then at least three islands are moving towards a better tourism facility. GNI, Great Nicobar Island, which I showed you, has tremendous potential for development of a container transshipment port. A, a few words on this. Container transshipment port is being discussed at the same location since 1970s. Study is ordered. IIT's people come and do the study and is filed. Unfortunately, on the grounds of two grounds, economic viability and environmental constraints. Now, over a period, three, four times it has been raised. And unfortunately, it never moved because of just these two points. And since 70 till now, what has happened is they, are, they have already built eco-sensitive areas have been identified there. Now it is becoming more difficult to make a container. But this government has taken a decision. Another study was ordered. Study has been completed. 10,000 rupees have, uh, 10,000 crores have been sanctioned. And let's see if it moves. They have shifted the location by uh, maybe uh, 50, 100 kilometers to avoid the eco-sensitive place. And I hope it comes through. Again, here, we need to balance viability, economic viability versus strategy requirement. That needs to be balanced. Now, with this understanding of strength, weakness, threats, and opportunities, I have certain policy recommendations. The broad policy recommendations could be Bridging the gap between aspiration plans of development and reality on the ground. That means you can keep talking about it. But this gap about your plans and aspirations and the reality on the ground demands strong political win. It demands a strategic vision, effective leadership, and lastly, but not the least, focused attention. We tend to forget these islands when we are looking at busy with our mainland requirements. They should be part and parcel of the uh, mainland whenever. These positive traits, as I said, are visible in the government. I hope it fructifies. We need to formulate 
an integrated plan for the overall development of the islands, not piecemeal developments, and then move towards the overall development. Long-term strategy for sustainable development is the need of the hour. Infrastructure, we need to, very easy to say what I am saying, development of ports, jetties, airfields, docking, and ship repair facilities need to be provided. A place like Andamans, where it is surrounded by sea, every island is surrounded by sea, demands docking and ship repair facility. That could be an industry by that itself, ship repair facility. Because there are thousands of small ships floating around there. And all this should be dual purpose. Because of lack of uh, land and forest areas, every facility that you provide in Andaman should be dual purpose, civil and military. In case of any emergency requirement, it sh the military should also be able to use it. And that is happening across the world. Environment, as I said, a scientific study needs to be done to strike a balance, a delicate balance between strategic and environmental need for developing these islands. I remember the pictures that you saw of the road construction. This is uh, up in 2014, we were still constructing the road in uh, GNI, Great Nicobar Island, which was damaged by tsunami. We had to cut 1,000 trees to make that road because the land was, had gone in. They were identified, they were cleared, they were cleared by the Environmental Ministry, Supreme Court monitored, panel cleared it, everything was done. Now we were stuck on payment for afforestation, in lieu of afforestation. Because Andaman government turned around and said, we do not have land to do afforestation. So there is no land to plant trees. There is a provision that afforestation, this is just for your knowledge, afforestation, in lieu of uh, afforestation can be done on the mainland. But the Babus won't accept the payment. And my man is sitting in Delhi, in Bhuvneshwar with a check. So we have to push it. So these are the type of, we need to get over that mindset. Engagement with literals, we need to enhance the image. We need to make them have a stake in the development of Andaman Nicobar Islands. Why do I say that? If you develop these islands militarily and economically, they will feel threatened. So what we need to do is to engage them in the development of Andaman Nicobar Islands. We need to engage them, make them have a stake in the development so that they know they are a part and parcel of this area. And Economic development, unfortunately, it happens in most of the places, remote places. Entire development process is government funded. Government is pumping money there for last 70, 80 years and things are not visible. So what we need to do, an option available is to encourage private sector. Difficult because they will look at profits. No private sector will come to uh, just come and establish things for you without any profits. So they must be encouraged within the constraints of environmental security issues. We have SEZs all over the mainland. We provide facilities to the private sector to develop their area. We could do that here too. Airlink needs to be established, enhanced. We need to make it more lucrative than move to uh, Port Blair, then going to Pattaya and other places. That is the type of thinking we need. And of course, decongest, provide small aircraft, small, small islands, provide them with small aircraft to move, provide them with helicopters to move, tourists to well use. They have come there to spend money and enjoy. Ports, same thing. As uh, I said for the <clears throat> uh, air link, luxury liner, which is in bad books nowadays because of what happened, what's happening in Mumbai, but luxury liner services must be provided. If one had started some time back, about four, three years back, but I don't know the uh, status. Communication, submarine cable we discussed has been laid. 
this needs to be expanded to the uh, other islands also. In conclusion, I would just say that imperative, it is imperative to appreciate that ANI provides potential to all of us to dominate the strategic sea lines, dominate these choke points. You saw the map, you remember what, I don't know if you have read it in the 80s, the Chinese had said it is like a metal chain, which India will pull a little bit to the east and block the uh, Malacca Strait. That type of uh, facility, I mean, strategic location you have. They make them the cornerstone Indian maritime strategy. In the 21st century globalized world, national security is as much function of economic dynamism and prosperity as it for creating military attack. So the security of Andaman Nicobar Islands must go hand in hand with the economic development. You can't have these two separated as far as these islands are concerned. We have not yet realized the importance of these islands. activity and security vision of the mainland. Till now, we have been looking at them as a separate entity. They are a part and parcel. That is what must be like. Thank you, and Jain. Thank you, sir. It was a really interesting presentation. We have some questions here, uh, which we hope that you can answer. Uh, the first question is by Amit Kumar, who is an intern with the center. One they were on grave uh, at the time, they didn't have to prove it. They basically <coughs> said, claimed that they were brave and caster just told it. Safe. Why don't you read it out, uh, uh, Ryan? It will be better for Herr Marshall Dikiroi, please. Okay, so, no, no, no. I was just. I, uh, could everyone please mute themselves? I will tell you. Yeah. Uh, India is an alternate heavyweight against China. How credible is this statement given we are one-fifth of Chinese economy, our defense expenditure is one-third of Chinese military budget, even here majority of our expenditure is towards revenue expenditure and dedicated to the army giving Air Force Navy crunched for funds. The conflict with China has again pushed us, no, has pushed us to prioritize land over maritime security. In this light, how can we be considered an alternative in the Indian Ocean region? We, to say that India is an alternate heavyweight for China may not be correct. Okay, both the countries are developing. They are developing much faster than us, and we, as I said, in the are in the uh, uh, catch-up mode. So we will leave that apart. If you look at the, I, the second part of the question is more relevant to today's talk where we are talking of Indian Ocean region. If you look at historically, the Indian Ocean region has always been important for us, for our trades, our economic development, our cultural spread of our Indian culture. But unfortunately, it was lost because of our northwards looking all the time. Okay. Yes. Incidents in Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, on the western sector, northwestern sector, at Pakistan, happenings in uh, Afghanistan have created again a sort of more focus in that area. But let me be very, very uh, said very, very emphatically that today India is not losing sight of the Indian Ocean region. You must be reading in the newspapers. You must be reading and listening on the news. Naval forces are given, in fact, more important than the other two. Not to say that the others are not being given. The Navy is progressing. Navy has a big advantage of establishment of the shipbuilding 
organizations with the involvement of their own officers. Most of the GMs are retired naval rear admirals all over if you look at it. Because from the inception, from the drawing phase onwards, the naval headquarters is involved in every ship. So please do not, do not think that the pre presently we are not giving due importance to the uh, Indian Ocean region. But yes, media will talk of Ladakh, will talk of happenings in Arunachal Pradesh, the, with Pakistan, terrorism being imported from Afghanistan. All this will be highlighted. But Navy is a slow service, silent service, not slow service, silent service. It is moving in the right direction. As of now, I can say confidently that we are moving in the right direction. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the second question is by Keshav Menon. What are your views on the Andaman Development Plan for the Sustainable Development of Little Andaman Island Vision Document by Niti Ayog? That is the big advantage we have in this government. A sustainable development is the basic requirement of any development at all. Piecemeal development, ad hoc development, sanctioning things ad hoc does not function, which has been the rule till now. If you look at the document in its entirety, you will realize that they are talking of a comprehensive plan, which I spoke of, of developing these islands. In fact, you have a vision document. Uh, this is the vision document for these islands. In fact, you have a a full-fledged document available for the development of the entire uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands. And we, and look at the way they have gone about it. Today, we have X Sinkan, who later on became the chief of naval staff, who post his retirement was the deputy chairman of the Island Development Authority. And today he's taken over, today means over two, three, four years back, he's taken over as the Lieutenant Governor of Andaman Nicobar. So, and he is, continues to remain as the Deputy Chairman, uh, Island Development Authority. So, he has that vision of what has gone through Andaman as a SINCAN. A naval officer knows about in, uh, Andamans more than uh, other service officers. Okay, then as a chief, he worked towards development of the armed forces in that island. And thereafter, as the, uh, in the Island Development Authority, his work. So the government has a very, very clear vision on developing uh, these islands today. And through Niti Ayok, through these officers who have experts on this field, they are pushing it. And I'm confident uh, things will, it will take time. Let's be very, very frank. It will take time. We need to be patient and focused and continue forward. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by Yukti Panwar, who is also a research intern at the center. Uh, she asks, sir, you mentioned about the need to balance between strategic and environmental concerns. How can we possibly achieve that in the case of Andaman and Nicobar Islands? especially since some of the indigenous population does not want to develop and integrate it into the mainland culture and way of life. Yeah. When I said there is a need to do a scientific study to find a balance, this is what the study would do, what you're saying. Uh, to give you the examples, Sentinel Islands, I think she, he or she, whoever it is, is focusing on that. They want to let them be. The study is to do uh, clearly indicate if it feels that these islands, these the Sentinel Islands, should not be touched. Okay, and they are not being touched. They will not be touched. I can assure you that. Okay. But then the study one, then when it moves down from there to the Jarawa tribe area, 
it has to take a decision whether 1000 square kilometer of forest should be reserved for 400 jarawat tribes the study must look at the pockets where the jarawat tribes are staying in this 1000 square kilometer study must look at the migration within the 1000 square kilometers study must look at their habits and habitats and various aspects and maybe identify certain portion which can be developed without affecting them but to expect uh, i'm being uh, may, may look a little more towards uh, development than no i'm giving you a simple example thousands kilometer for this whereas the jarawas are really enjoying the main facilities provided for them in port blair i don't know if you know panth hospital gb panth hospital there has our entire floor reserved for jarawas they can come any time get the treatment and go and they come they know this is for us they move in they two people come lie down there the doctors go talk to them take the interpreters or translators talk to them treat them after 3 days of treatment quietly they walk back into the jungle this i am telling you the practical things so when you do a scientific study with local environment these things will emerge so that is what we talk when we talk of scientific uh, balancing of environment with strategic requirement we don't want to do what happened in the uh, what the uh, us did in other islands we don't want to push everybody out and raise the entire island to ground and construct only the military assets there no sir we are different so that is what i mean when we say there are there may be certain uh, like sentinel island i am sure they will not yes if they do it's a good provide even today by the way we provide them with it. we have contact people who are known to them who go slowly provide them with whatever is required and come back i am not saying force them to uh, give up everything and come into the mainstream no but that also is a major discussion by the way do we let them be where they are the world has gone ahead so much there are other reasons of their change over from the present environment to the modern environment and suffer so there will be large number of issues psychological issues the medical issues okay so th- that is why we use the word i said scientific study a whole some study yeah thank you sir uh, the next question is by anushka saxena she says thank you i marshal sir for your insightful comments my question is regarding the relevance of ani in the development of submarine co- communication cables because they form an important part of india's global cyberspace communications but our problem is logistical mobilization in case there is a cable break have we been able to utilize island response to such breaks if so how entire submarine cable around the world will have this problem this is not isolated to andamans within our own land mainland we have different types of different uh, connectivity but when we our connectivity our and our it people who work with uh, us it is through these submarine cables so the system exists it has to be translated or transported onto this between uh, mainland and andamans and it is there it cannot be that without such a facility available we will uh, lay the cable so there is no nothing nothing to fear about cable would get cut cable would get cut unintentionally cable would get cut intentionally by somebody 
cable, cables would get cut due to natural uh, disasters. Provisions exist. Procedures exist to repair. Standby systems exist. So we should not have this fear of 1200 kilometers of submarine cable. We are talking of submarine cable from here across the globe to US and other places. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is by Anjan Kumar. He says, he or she says, thank you, Air Marshal, for your engaging presentation and incredible understanding from your experience. My question, how is India planning to counter Chinese presence from Indo-Pacific near ANI? Is there a plan of action or a so-called white paper currently in place? Also, what is your opinion on AUKUS? Although India is supporting it now, will it be a threat to the ANI islands in future? Okay. China is far ahead in its economic and military development. Let's be, that's the bottom line. China is well ahead because it has progressed much faster than us. It's a different type of government. It's a different type of country. Their procedures and way of functioning is different, which cannot be implemented in India. India is a democracy, a functioning democracy, <laughs> a step further which could be a hindrance in many of the strategic decisions as well today. Okay. China is constructing ships, its warships at such a fast rate that we are not able to catch up. It's a fact. Our resource, availability of resource has to be divided between the West sector, Eastern sector, and extended Eastern sector to undermines. So we have, but the type of resource that we want, we do not have. So today, I'm sure you must have read in, is there from open book, we have a, evolved a system of mission-based deployment. If when you don't have resources, what do you do? Even in, within your family, when you don't have resources, what do you do? You do a study, what is the, and prioritize, and do your expenditure accordingly. So um, in mission-based deployment, a study is carried out on which are the areas that are vulnerable, which are the areas which demands immediate attention, things are prioritized, and Groupings are made and based on the mission, based on the requirement of that area, deployment is done and they are rotated. To give you a simple example, we our ships are always available in the Gulf for the anti-piracy. So do I have to put additional ships there? This type of study is carried out. I have Andaman Nicobar Island with X number of ships already there. But my requirement today is much more in here. So I supplement and put them as a mission-based deployment for some time. My ships are moving across to uh, Southeast Asian countries. During the return, they spent four days there. You understand? So mission-based deployment is carried out. To say that we will not, China can, in the present uh, condition, play hell into us may not be correct. They are developing, but they have not. Just remember how long is his uh, logistics stretched into the Indian Ocean. All the way from China, if he sends his ships here, he has to have logistics plan to support them, to maintain them deployed there. It's difficult for him. And that is why, if you notice, he is at looking at what I said, uh, string of pearls, influencing countries, trying to bring in the ships into uh, Sri Lanka, trying to act alone in anti-piracy missions. That means his ships are moving up and down all the time. Otherwise, the whole world is getting together 
and working as a team for anti-piracy. China says, I'll do my own. So it is trying, let's see. Uh, thank you, sir. Another question by Mehul Singhil, who is also a research intern at, at the Center for Security Studies. So, sir, I remember reading an article where an idea was floated that once theaterization has been achieved, the ANC, due to its being the most integrated service, could be taken as a core to form a new expeditionary force. I feel that if we are to become a major power, we must further we must further develop extra uh, expeditionary capabilities to be able to project our power further. What are your views on this matter, sir? And how can we exploit the high degree of integration in the ANC? ANC being developed as an expedition force. The, when you read in these newspapers, you must look at the source of the newspaper. Okay. These would be ideas of the writer. You understand? This I'm just telling you for the future. Whenever you read such articles, you must look at the source. Is, has, is the author giving his views? Is the author talking on source-based input? Understand? And who, who would not like to have the expeditionary forces? But the point is, do we have the resources? Do we have the capability in terms of resources as of now? Okay. So what the sequence of action would be is to first equip ourselves to guard our own country. And that doesn't mean that we just restrict ourselves to the mainland or island, these islands. This will be expanded outwards. And then slowly as and when we have resources, those things can be spoken of, those things can be thought of. But to speak of developing Andaman Nicobar Command as an expeditionary force now itself is to, yes, you must look 50 years hence. You must talk of future. But to expect it to be done in next 10 years, no, sir. Not. And uh, dry service or joint command, it is working fine. There are there were tremendous issues. Let's be very frank. There were tremendous issues to the extent the land was held by different services. I couldn't construct my service at my command headquarters on a naval land because I was an Air Force officer. You understand? All that we got over now. Major, major changes have been brought. Even procurement has been centralized. You know, on the mainland, three services do their own procurement. And there also it was continuing. That has been joined. Tremendous problems were there. And moreover, now with the CDS coming in, everything is given to him. And he allocates to uh, ANC. So things are moving. Mainland jointness, there are two aspects. Till now, am I to say that there was no jointness till now? Okay. So today, till date, we, our jointness was in terms of jointness at the planning stage. The entire missions used to be planned jointly. The three services would sit and plan. Now we are moving one step or two steps ahead where we want to have joint commands because of resources, what I said earlier, resource crunch. Because of resources, better coordination, better utilization. Okay, and uh, difficulties will always be there. Let's be very frank. But no service. Air Force has been blamed time and again for not being a part of uh, or being a hindrance to uh, progress in jointness. No, sir. no. Air Force gives his points of view on utilization of the uh, its assets, 
in terms because the air power is totally different. We talk of ubiquitous. It can be utilized anywhere from, if you remember exercise Gagan Shakti, the entire force was, did exercise in the west and moved suddenly to the east. Overnight, they were moved in because we have these aircraft now to support the movements. So all this will have to be factored into the uh, joint commands and that is being worked out. It will work. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question by Atvi Patel, who is a research intern at the center. Keeping in mind the Act East policy with an intention to have us have us to end an economic cooperation with East Asian nations, can it be assumed that ANI might play a critical role as a linkage for the same? And if so, can it be said that the ANI is capable enough to withhold such ambitions of New Delhi? And if not, what should be the immediate plan of action from India? Also keeping in mind the geopolitical importance of the island. Is it possible to strengthen the military power on the island by cooperating with other friendly nations in order to fast forward the process of countering Chinese presence in the region? I'll, I'll answer the second part first. We are cooperating tremendously with the neighboring countries. Uh, as far as the armed forces goes, around the uh, we have a system known as uh, coordinated patrolling. Must have read in the, must have seen in the tweets also of the Navy and the PIB release also, where the two countries are do, doing coordinated patrolling of the region, the ships and the air assets. We do coordination, coordinated patrolling with Indonesia thrice a year. We do coordinated patrolling with Malaysia, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. So almost every month, the ships and air assets, limited numbers, uh, do a patrolling of that uh, zone for any uh, foreign activity, any poaching activity, illegal immigration, various things. So, and uh, three per country means almost 12 per year exercises are being conducted, okay? So this is a, a, then you have a million exercises. The next million is in February 22, where uh, as of yesterday, 46 countries are, uh, have been invited to participate. It was being held in uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands uh, till four years back. Now, the number of countries, when I conducted in 2014, we had 14 countries. Today, 46 countries. So, the infrastructure cannot take up. So, it has been shifted to Wiseac for some time. As and when infrastructure comes up, maybe it will uh, go back to Port Blair. Okay. Every ship, the aim is that every ship that goes to Southeast Asian countries halts at Port Blair and carries out an exercise, even the foreign ships, as far as possible. Singapore ships come there, Japanese ships come there. So there's tremendous amount of interaction. But to say that we base their forces there, no. No country will permit it. But we ourselves don't have, don't have that type of infrastructure to do it. That's the bottom line. But then to uh, base their forces, no. I don't think there, there is any plan and there will be any plan. And uh, first was, I think, act east policy, economic act east policy. The aim is that. Aim should be that. Okay. Container tramp shipment port will be, if constructed, will be a major, major component of that. Where tourism would be a major, major component. Okay, when we start having aircraft, civil aircraft flying to Southeast Asian countries through Port Blair, it will become a major component. That means it takes passengers from Port Blair, uh, from mainline to the Port Blair, continues to Southeast Asian countries like Thailand and others, coming back, picks up passengers from their tourist. So this could aim 
entire aim is to involve these islands in our ethics policy. But then tremendous work is required to be done. Uh, it's a long drawn process. As I said, we have miles to go. Let's see. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last question for today is by Anjan Kumar again. Does India soft power has the potential for economic development and bringing it closer to the mainland population? Are there policies in place which support soft power development? If you look at Indian soft power historically, all over Southeast Asia, you have the Indian temples, Indian gods, features everywhere. In Indian culture, Indian soft power has been very, very active in this region. What we need to do is to exploit it. Exploit it has been neglected, let's be very frank, has been neglected to a time and again. We need to exploit it. And it is happening. I see it happening regularly. Uh, in, in, uh, in the present uh, uh, tenure of the government, there is no doubt that soft power will play you cannot have this hard power one way all the time. It will not. It will not bear fruits for long. It will not be easily accepted by the people being suppressed. Ultimately, it will be the soft power along with a bit of hard which will and make you influence people. It will never ever be hard. But look what happened in Afghanistan. Look what happened in Iraq. Look what's happening in Syria. Across the world, the flashpoints that I was telling you, hard power cannot do it for long. Go back into history, World War, what happened? There has to be a, a mix of the two and more of uh, soft power to influence people. You think the happenings in, in China, Uyghurs will succeed? At some point of time, it has to, people will react. Let the Chinese influence reduce. If it reduces, see what happens. So let's be very clear. Soft power has a major role to play in influencing the world, in influencing the population, in expanding your influence across the region and will be one of the major, major tools to influence people. Well, thank you, sir. That brings us to the end of the Q&A session. I'd now like to hand over the floor to Kritika Karnakar. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I would like to extend the vote of thanks to our uh, speaker today, uh, Air Marshal P.K. Roy. Um, thank you so much for this well-paced, systematic uh, presentation on the topic, on such a vast topic especially, and also addressing most of the factors be it economical, uh, social, political, or uh, environmental, um, about the region. Um, and what made today's uh, presentation even more special was uh, your uh, experience, which uh, was reflected um, in the way you explained the maps and everything else. So uh, I truly believe this was a very beneficial session for all the students, for everyone who attended, uh, even for us. Um, and uh, I would also like to extend uh, my thanks to um, uh, the center director, uh, Dr. Pankaja, uh, for organizing this event, as well as uh, Ryan for uh, introducing us to uh, Air Marshal Bikira. Thank you so much. Thank you, Air Marshal Bikira. I really appreciate you coming over and delivering the lecture. It was worth listening, and we were enlightened a lot. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much. We might uh, uh, welcome you whenever we go offline, which means we have an, on, an offline classes and all activities. Do look for our center website uh, with regard to publications. We recently published uh, two of those policy papers. One was on crafting national security strategy for India. And the second one was 
uh, the envisioning India's uh, role in the Indo-Pacific uh, as such. So we are also doing policy uh, recommendations and, and work relevant to the policymakers as such. Uh, if you can really send us your, your, your address, we might be very willing to send you our set of publications mm -hmm. as a matter of gesture and uh, gratitude as such. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a learning process for me also. Let's be very frank. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.